We grew up in a, in a climate, in an atmosphere where Lumberton, for instance, had three water drinking fountains, white, colored, and Indian, three restrooms, movies. The first time I ever bought a hamburger in Lumberton, it was from a white building and they handed it out a window on the side and on the front door had a metal sign that said white only. That was the kind of prejudicial atmosphere that we were reared in here in Robinson County at the time. I saw such unfairness happen in the judicial system here that motivated me to become a lawyer because if an Indian boy got in trouble and went into the court system, he was treated quite differently and, and punished more severely than a white person would. Uh, so you saw those injustices develop here and, and all the things, but what it did was it made us tough. It made us, we didn't, we didn't bow down and we didn't back up. And consequently, uh, it gave us a reputation of being violent, being in trouble with the law, doing some other things like that, that, uh, that made us different. Well, I think it had its origin in an occurrence that uh, uh, happened in the court system in Lumberton. Uh, as I recall, there was a divorce action and a white couple going on in the court system in Lumberton, and the evidence that was produced during the divorce uh, indicated that the woman was having an affair with an Indian man. Uh, and for whatever reason, the judge uh, in the divorce case uh, made a, a remark in open court that he could not understand why a white woman would get involved with an Indian. And that sort of had its origin that I remember that that somehow got communicated to uh, a guy named Catfish Cole who was the uh, Grand Wizard of the Ku Klux Klan and who lived over in South Carolina. And uh, that's what I understand the origin that kind of brought uh, the idea that the Klan was going to hold a rally in Robertson County up in the Maxton area, which is now called Hayes Pond, I believe. The fact that they were coming here uh, under that curtain angered the Indians to the extent that uh, on the Saturday that this occurred during the day, uh, there was a sheriff at that time named Malcolm McLeod. And I remember him coming to Pembroke here in this town uh, in an effort to try to quell the situation because it was pretty obvious that there's the potential for it to grow violent uh, and that somebody was, was going to get seriously hurt. He was not able to do so. And the other side of that is that the Indian people here in Pembroke that at that time that I knew about ended up buying all of the ammunition that was available from the hardware store here in Pembroke. So th at that time, the word had gotten around that uh, there was going to be a confrontation. I was in my fourth year of college at that time, about to graduate from this institution. My father and my mother was alive. Uh, I think all my brothers were gone. Uh, I think they were off in the service. Um, my youngest brother was home, and he was not old enough to get involved in it at the time. I didn't ask them. <laughs> I, I didn't ask for permission because I'm, I, I just didn't and I think I might, I don't know what they would have said, but I'm sure my mother would not have sent me to a fight in Maxton, but I just didn't ask. And so I, I, at the time I was in college and I just, but I, I would know, you know, when something like that's going to happen, it's not going to be hard in Pembroke at that time, but the nature of a thing like that, to get up a group of people because we had people that would, would fight. If you pushed them, they would fight. And this was a push. This was, a, this was an affront uh, and a push for them to say that they were going to come in Robertson County, our county, and hold a rally and be in the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, that's just a, a, a recipe for disaster. Uh, that's that's what that would be. And they're just fortunate, I'm telling you, I'll say it again, they're very fortunate that somebody didn't get killed.
I think what was interesting was the fact that Dr. Walter Gale, and he was a, they didn't call him a chancellor, they called him a president at the time, he was a white man. And it was, um, it was nice to see him from his position, both as the president of the college and a white man, to involve himself to the extent that he did because uh, he was, he really was giving us some tactical advice and some other things and participating in it to the extent that you wouldn't normally think the president of the college would do. And I, I don't think any of us would have ever told on him uh, at a time, but uh, that was enlightening and uh, quite comforting to us uh, here at the college and everything because he was, he was there because most of the people here in the college at the time was Indians at the time too. Uh, he had had some military background, I guess in World War II or whatever, but at that time he was the president of the college. I knew him very well and he gathered together what I would define as a team. There was four of us, as I remember, Ken Maynard was one of them, I was one, and I've been trying to think of the other two, and I don't remember right off. But we met in his office, right over where the library was at that time, and we devised a plan of attack, if you wanted to call it that. First to go and look at the field where they were going to hold this rally, and, and plan some uh, strategy, and he was helping us with his military background. We went and looked and it turned out that this was a field that had tall broom straw, I would define it as that. And he saw an opportunity for us and the plan was that we were going there that night and after they got set up is to determine which way the wind was blowing uh, because they parked their cars in the field where that broom straw were, was and set up their platform. We were going to determine which way the wind was going to blow and we were going to set the field on fire. The clan had set up a platform with a large spotlight, like one bigger than the one shining on me now. And the Lowry boy had a shotgun. And before we could set the field on fire, we were in our position to start something. He shot that light out with a shotgun. And when he did, chaos erupted and everybody went together and we started hearing gunfire and fighting and this type of thing. Yeah, because there were some people that would have done some serious damage to, yeah. you know, there's knives up there, there was guns, there was, they came equipped. They, they were not going to hold a rally that night, I can tell you that. They never got, they never got to say a word. I mean, I, to my knowledge, they didn't, they turned on the light and and uh, all hell broke loose. And that was, I didn't think they got to say very much at all. Some of the Klansmen had realized that they had gotten in the wrong place and uh, that they in the wrong, at the wrong time. And they were in their cars trying to leave. And that's when we began to have fights. Hitting them when they were inside the car trying to move, dragging some of them out of the car actually having some significant physical contact with them. Well, unbeknown to us at that time, the governor of the, of the state of North Carolina had positioned about 50 highway patrolmen on the perimeters of this thing, anticipating that something like this might happen. And so after we were right in the middle of the fight, in came the highway patrol. Uh, several of them. I know this because I got arrested. Two of them had me in custody and about that time there was a young man that I knew who lived up right up the street here on Pine Street. I can't call his name. Somehow he had gotten a military rifle um, and as they were taking me away, he ran past me and them, and like a soldier does, he fell down on the ground and had that rifle aimed. Well, they saw that that was a significant situation that was much more important than arresting me, and they turned me loose to get him. And when they did, of course, I was gone. <laughs> so uh, I, never, I never had to face the, 
possibility of being arrested because they didn't know who I was. We were in, in the middle of everything. So they turned me loose. There's a lot of people there. There was a lot of Indians there that night. And it was a, it was a pretty significant confrontation. It, it, was, it was quite confusing. I mean, we ran into the crowd and, you know, they were trying to get away and we were trying to, for the lack of a better word, beat the hell out of them. And so well, that's... Uh, uh, I, I, I wouldn't take in, we weren't taking counts that night, but there was a lot of Indians there, and it's, there's quite a few clansmen. They were trying to get out. And had that boy not shot out the light, I think it would have been a much more serious situation because when the darkness hit, uh, we just sort of got into a physical fight instead of a shootout, and so it, it worked out probably to the best. And the timing of the of the uh, North Carolina patrol coming in. I think all of that helped. That particular night, because of the involvement of law enforcement, I think uh, everybody thought that it was a wise thing to scatter, not end up being arrested and this type of thing, because uh, we just didn't know what was gonna happen. I, when they turned me loose, I didn't, I didn't go back and ask them any questions or anything like that. So, but I, I think it was a proud point for the Lumbee Indians at that time, because, um, and, and it got to be a national thing, quite frankly. It was in Life magazine, as you know. Uh, Simeon Oxendine and Shell Wark captured the flag and it made Life magazine. Simeon was a gunner in World War II. He was a, he was a gunner on a B-29. He, uh, you know, these guys had fought in the war. Some of them, they were older than we were, of course, but. But there were some tough guys up there. They just picked, uh, I mean, there were some tough people up there. And they're, they're very fortunate that they didn't get uh, treated worse than they did. I really think, had the governor not sent in the highway patrol and sent in the force that he did, I'm not sure some of them would not have been killed or badly hurt. I think that was probably the thing that, that kept it within some realm because it had the potential to really go bad. I happened to be traveling after that and I stopped in a place in West Virginia to have lunch and the people in the booth behind me was talking about it and that was like a month later but they were still talking about it and I was on my way up to uh, Detroit and I stopped in West Virginia and, and they were having a conversation and I thought that was kind of unique. But it was, a, it was a proud thing for the Lumbee people. I remember a cartoon in the Charlotte Observer that showed Catfish Coal running across the map of North Carolina and South Carolina, and he was running and crossing the line, and he had an arrow stuck in his buttock. And uh, so it was, it was quite a, it got quite a lot of uh, attention from the news media. And so that was one of the times when they thought they were coming into our county and push us and I don't know what they thought was going to happen, but I can tell you that it was a mistake and they realized it very quickly that they had gotten into the hornet's nest and, and should not have come in here. I, and I understand after that it was so embarrassing to the Klan that they actually disbanded that situation that he was involved in. Um, so it got to be a big embarrassment for them. They had never had in their history anything like that happen to them. So they just came in the wrong place and, and picked on the wrong people. Right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and and I, as I said, it's, it was a point of pride for us. Yes. That's the nature of the Indian people here. Uh, you know, if uh, you know, we're, they're good people. We're good people, but we will retaliate, and we will just do that. And and uh, we don't like to be pushed. And that's just the nature of the Lumbee people.